to say okay. a little bit of the Okay. Okay, so everybody, welcome. Now working further. See you, Um So my name is Martha Coffey, and uh, I want to welcome everybody today on behalf of the Irish Book Club. And I want to introduce Nash Kennan, who's going to be doing this uh, lecture, and tell us all about genealogy and DNA. And we have lovely refreshments, tea, coffee, water, whatever you want over here. So everybody help yourself. Okay, I'll hand you over to Matt. Right. Oh, maybe I'll show you. <laughs> Give you that back. <laughs> I don't have my notes, so this is going to be interesting. Yeah. Uh, well, to introduction to genetic genealogy, what it is, Matt, and Matt, take it closer to your mouth. Get it closer to your mouth. Yeah. yeah. Just, just like I did. Wait for me. Dear Eve, Matt is I'm not a professional genealogist, not a professional geneticist, I'm not a professional genetic genealogist. Guy with a very understanding wife. <laughs> guy who spent a great deal of time looking at this stuff. Now, this is my first tree. <laughs> I didn't capture names, so I need to go back and report them. <laughs> but this is uh, when I was in seventh grade, the assignment was to trace our ancestors back to the American Civil War ancestors. We weren't here. <laughs> so I did the best I could. Keep an eye on this guy up here, the sheep skinner at the top. He's still my brick wall. Oh. My Hannon brick wall. Right? I can't get past it. I'm close. I'm close to getting past it with DNA, but not yet. Oh, what else is interesting here is I'm, I said I wanted to be a banker. I'm currently working at my second bank. I'm not in accounting. I'm in IT. But I'm in a bank. Which is interesting. Here's my first DNA test. Uh, 2017, or two, two, 2007. Uh, it was a Y DNA test. 12 markers. You cannot get that test anymore. It is not offered. It's too small and insignificant. Um, my sister Liz sent me an email. It was a New York Times article about how you can figure out through the use of DNA testing to see which branch or invasion weed um, you, your ancestors came to Ireland with. And we're like, okay, that sounds interesting. We did not come through the Iberian wave, um, so we came through probably through uh, Belgium. Um, what is genetic genealogy? Um, it's the use of DNA in studying your family tree. It's very important to think about it like that. DNA testing is of no more important than a census record, right? So everybody's like, oh, DNA, DNA, it's a census record. Um, it, it's, you still need to prove everything with it. There's a lot of testing that goes you know, involved in it. It's great for the testing companies because you need more and more and more cousins mm -hmm. in order to prove this stuff. So it's good for them because it sells kids. Um, it, it's a pointer. It tells you where to look. It's actually, it's helped focus my traditional um, genealogy research because of that. It's like, this person over here is very interesting. You should really look in, into them. You build out a tree for them. You know, like, holy moly, we're related. That's great. Um, and while it doesn't lie, it may not always be able to answer the particular question that you are asking. And it has to be used. It cannot stand alone with traditional paper DNA. You can't just take a test and go all the way back to Moses. You can't do that. <laughs> you need to do that. It's too close to your yeah. computer. It's too close yeah. to your computer. Yeah. It gives, gives it, yeah. OK, traditional, you, you probably everybody in this room does traditional genealogy. Is that true? Fair to say? Right? You're trying to trace back with Genetic genealogy, you're trying to come down and go to the side. You're looking for cousins. Everything is about cousins, so you can triangulate back to, you know, who, who 
were her parents, and are you related? And we'll, we'll come to that. It's called triangulation. Uh, basics. What is DNA? It is the stuff of life. Uh, it's a complex molecule, which is a blueprint for you. All of us, everybody in this room and outside of this room is 99% the same, right? So we're looking at a 0.1% difference in DNA. So everybody says there's differences, there's no difference. <laughs> Adenine, thymine, they go together. You know, A, T, G, and C, you've seen all that before. Um, a pair of these bases is called a nucleotide. Um, before we go too much further, I assume you all came here in a car. I don't expect you to know how to refine gasoline because you drive a car. I don't expect you to know how to build a car because you came here in a car. We're going to keep that high level approach to, to this. <laughs> um, the DNA that we're testing is found in the nucleus of every cell and the mitochondria of, of every cell as well. Um, 23 chromosomes in the nucleus, one strand chromatin uh, for each chromosome for each parent. So you see the, here's Ma, here's Dad, right? And the a, a and T, G and a C, so that's how it works. You can never have, you know, they, they, they don't mix, they just don't. So, you know, you can't have an A and a G, they don't, they don't mix. Um, y DNA comes from a father to a son, MT DNA, which is mitochondrial DNA, uh, which is very interesting. It is from a mother to all of her children, but only females pass it on. Uh, X chromosome, uh, which is sex chromosome, we're going to use some, some words. We can say sex, and it might even be a sperm. Oh dear. Um, um, X chromosome, XX, and you get a female. XY, you get a male. That's how it works. Mostly. Remember, we're keeping it at a high level, we're not going to edge cases. Things we're not doing that. We don't have enough time. Uh, this is the structure of chromosome. The centromere right here. If somebody wants to remind me later on to come back to centromere, please do that. Um, each strand is called a chromatid. Looks like their formatting got a little wonky there. But the chromatid is important to know. You get one of each in each chromosome from each parent. I like this, this little drawing. Um, the nucleus, and I counted them, there's actually, there's 23 of them in there. This is the autosomes are found in here. This is where we basically do our regular family DNA testing. The mitochondria are the powerhouses of the cell, if you don't know. They are what's responsible for taking oxygen and making um, energy for the cells, for your body. So you can thank your mothers for that. <laughs> Genetic inheritance. <laughs> We're all 50-50, our parents, right? Half your mom, half your dad. That's how you think about it, right? <laughs> That's not it. It's a little more complex. It's more like this. Oh. Right? This is how you should think about it. It's not pizza, it's fruit salad. Because, you know, so take half the bowl, there's blueberries on this side, there's no blueberries on this side. That's how you start to get uh, differences between ethnicity reports and, you know, my, my sister doesn't look like me. Why is that? It's where fruit salad, that's why. There's a name for fruit salad, it's called recombination. We'll get into that. Uh, what tests can be done? Are they all the same? Nope. They're not. <laughs> Y-DNA, as I said, is for your dad's line. Mitochondrial DNA is for your mother's line. Autosomal, that's at AT, is for your whole bloody clan. No. <laughs> oh, I thought there was another thing in there. There isn't. Um, I'm operating without the net up here, folks. So. This is a very interesting little chart. What DNA test should I take? And there's this. Bethany was kind enough to show me. It is, what DNA test should I take? And this is, it's actually kind of timely. This is slightly out of date, but it, it's timely if you follow DNA news, as I do. 
Are you worried about big data or the government getting a hold of your DNA? Has anybody heard about that recently? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Are you? I don't particularly care. No. Um, and the, the red box here is very important. Don't take a test. If you're worried about it, don't do it. Don't support the future. When I took that test back in 2007, it was really weird that I was sending my DNA through the mail. Mm -hmm. There's now a company in Australia that you send them an old envelope and they extract the DNA from where the person licked it 100 years ago. So we oh always been sending our DNA through the mail. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. how are you going to hide from it? You can't. Get over it. And yeah, we'll, we'll get into the privacy concerns later. Um, do you want to know if you're a Neanderthal? My sister Liz does. So <laughs> she should take the, the 23 and B test down here. So this is just a little goofy thing. You know, just, it's, it's, I think it would If you read the wording, Are you wanting medical data? That sounds particularly Irish to me. <laughs> All right. It's like bear no English. <laughs> Why DNA? The paternal line. Short tandem repeats. When you take a, a Y DNA test from, say, Family Tree DNA, which is one of the main companies in the United States for testing Y DNA, um, they're going to give you a short tandem repeat. That's just, you know, it's a, a repeating segment in what's called junk DNA. Uh, it's, they're, they're finding it's not really junk, but they still consider it junk because they don't know what it does. Um, it's just repeats. And it, it'll get you only so far. As we'll, we'll go into it. it. You know, it'll tell you, oh, you're R1B. Great, what does that tell me? Not really a lot. To get really into the testing, you need to do single nuclear nucleotide polymorphism, which is, you know, another cost. So it, it can get pricey, why DNA testing. Um, you, the way we've done it is because we started so long ago is, um, you know, you, you figure it out, you go, okay, now there's this, this, this SNP, that's what they call it, SNMP, a SNP, um, that I need to test for. Here's 20 more bucks. Okay, there's another one. There's yeah. 20 more bucks. Yeah. So they nickel and dime you. But there's, if, if you're rich enough, there's a $500 test you take, bam, you got it all. So, mm. yeah, it's not cheap. But if you're interested in it, you got the money, it's great. Um, haplogroups, you may have heard about haplogroups, like R1B, et cetera. It's a haplogroup. Uh, this is where you get the designations for that kind of stuff. That's me. Mm. So this is starting furthest back, and then we come down, through, and that's me. There's three of us. That's all I know. It's, it's, it's really small. Uh, for most people in the U.S. that use family tree DNA, uh, 23andMe provides a high level, but really, you're not going to get much further than that with, with 23andMe. Uh, you got to go to family tree DNA, where there's another company called yseek.com. They do testing in the United States as well. They're based in Germany. So that you can also pick up your Irish cousins as well as like, don't do this voice. It's significantly cheaper. But you don't get all the matching. You don't get your matches. You just get the data. What is what is the answer to the question? Why is equal answer? Uh, here we have the migration route out of Africa for R1B. We came up through the Caucasus and down. Um, I always kind of figured we came through that way through like, you know, Istanbul and Constantinople or whatever you want to call it. Mm. And but uh, no, it looks like we came over the north. And I think that's is that the Black Sea? I don't know that region as well as I should. But you can see where we were heading. And that's you know 25,000 years ago. That's twice as long, more than twice as long as the last ice age ended. Is when R1B formed. So now you can see the modern concentrations. Um, Ireland is greater than 80%. The winner of the R1B prize is Wales. They are eight, over 85% R1B. So if you take your test at 23andMe, they say, you're R1B. Great. If you're 
Western European. Congratulations. What does it tell you? Not a lot. You and everybody else in here. Um, except for you. Have you done it? Jim's different. He's the outlier. He's, he, he's German, so he's Central European. Uh, placing mutations on the timeline. Let's see, we're going to have to do this. Pardon me, folks. Matt and I am an introvert. <laughs> um, here we go. So this is the history of R1B, right, down through the ages. So you get to 269 here, which was on my list. This is the copper age. Great, I'm on 269. That's about as far as you're going to get with an S, a standard STR test from family tree, right? Great, I'm in the copper age. Awesome. Where are my relatives? Everywhere, man. Everywhere. <laughs> so it, you know, it drills down. Uh, when we first started doing the testing, the P312. This was this was the new thing. Hey, who's a P312? That's awesome. Well, that now we're in the middle of the Bronze Age. Awesome, great. And you know, it just keeps going down. And the L21 that popped up. Oh man, the world caught on fire because this is where Ireland is. Mm. And then it just keeps going from there. You can see it gets wider and wider as these things start getting you know, more and more broken out. M222 right here. This is the O'Neill clan of Ireland. You know, uh, Nile of the Nine Hostages. That's him. So that's like the gold standard of Irish Y-DNA. <laughs> so to, to find an Irishman that is an M222, you're, you're really looking. Okay, supposedly this will work. This is just a different view of it. It doesn't work, we'll move on. There's nothing really all that important here. I'm over it already. Yeah. <laughs> oh, great. You don't know her last name. How are you going to get past it? Empty DNA is the answer. 
for a price. For a price. Uh, it has a very slow mutation rate, like really significantly slow. It comes out unchanged for thousands of years, and oh, some some little mistake gets made, and they can trace those mutations back and actually see the, the evolutionary history of the person. You know, it's how we all a little different. Very similar, a little different. Um, so there we go. So you see the evolutionary history, and there's the, the general sense that it's not all that important. And I'm H2, H2, A1. There'll be a test. I expect you all to remember that. It's actually the one of the most common haplogroups in all of Europe, not just Western Europe, all of Europe. So it's it's really it's very common. I get, you know, oh you got an H, you got an H2 match. Oh, great. Another one. It's like daily. Uh, you never find them because it's back so far. It's thousands, tens of thousands of years. So that's the slow mutation rate. Here we go. ATDNA, the latecomer who set the world on fire. Um, this was not available when I started testing. When it came available, it was incredibly expensive. It, it blew that $500 price tag I gave you earlier away. It was insanely expensive. Only really rich people were, were doing it. Um, but now you can get it for $59. Mm. This, is, this is the test when you think about DNA testing that, that you get. Um, if you've ever seen Finding Your Roots or any of those shows, they give you the, um, the ethnicity reports. That's this test. So it's the family finder or the ancestry DNA or any of those. So, um, let's see. Uh, this is one that looks at not just your mom or your dad, like the, the, the first two, but everybody. It's all your cousins. All your aunts, all your uncles, everybody out there. And these are the places where you can easily find that test. Um, hands up, who's already taken a DNA test? All right, so quite a few. All right, I'm going to go out on a limb and say most of you have tested an ancestry. Why do I say that? <laughs> that chart right there. <laughs> <laughs> this is the most recent release of it. There are over 15 million people in the database right now. Um, you'll notice that 23B is lagging behind a little bit, that they're not quite up to the line. Estimates are that they are approaching 10 million at this point. So 20, they're doing a good job with the marketing. If you go to the CDS, you can pick up the 23B test. Um, I was shocked at my heritage. They were a late comer to the game. You see, they didn't even start till here. But I think they advertise heavily in Europe. And that's why there's so many people there. I've had mixed results. I, I haven't tested with them, but I've uploaded my DNA to them, and I'm not all that impressed. That's pretty much the general consensus. They had a, an update recently, and uh, apparently it, it, it stepped things up a bit, but I haven't really looked at it again. Um, Family Tree DNA, who used to be like you know the dominant player in the field, have been lagging, and I worry about their future. They're, how do you compete with Mm. You don't. You can't. And then this other one, GEDmatch. Yes, yes, GEDmatch. We'll come to GEDmatch in a bit. GEDmatch isn't a test. It is a website. Um, now this is going to get interesting. Um, most of you probably know this. This is the Ancestry DNA page. Um, hello, Matt. This is Fluff. This is Fluff. This is fluff. This is this is the meat and the matter here. But we're, everybody loves the ethnicity estimates. I'm 90% Irish, so I have that as a right. Um, ethnicity. It is that, that ethnicity test. It isn't quite so yet. Um, years ago, Family Tree Deep. I uploaded my ancestry results to Family Tree DNA. That's one of the reasons, one of the ways they stay in the game. And, you know, got the ethnicity results in, you know, like 20% Turkish or something yeah. like that, right? And they're like, where is this coming from? Well, then they refresh their algorithm, and I'm no longer Turkish. <laughs> <laughs> so I've, I've gone through this, this 
ethnicity stuff before. It, it's not quite to. It's, it's getting to be a good, reliable science. It's not quite there yet. If you get your results and you're like, you know, oh, I'm 93 percent. That Hannon, he's got nothing on me. You know, next week they could redo, re, you know, do it again, and you're, you're 92 percent. You know, it changes. It changes over time. It's based on the database size, which is why ancestry is just kicking butt in this field in the ethnicity report. But it, it will change on people like just freak out. I thought I was. They told me no, no. You're you. That's that's the bottom line. You're you're who you are. You know, whatever you want to take away from that. Um, it's gonna. It's going to change. Right? They change the algorithm. It's based on the samples in the database. It's based on they go out into the population of the region <laughs> and they they get a like gold standard person who's been there. Their family's been there a million years, and they say this is what this should look like, and they compare against that. Right? <laughs> Ireland likes DNA testing. <coughs> the numbers on Ireland liking DNA testing are insane. Um, if I could get the web browser work, which I can, I would show it to you. But if you have Ancestry, look this up. They'll give you the ability to look at the different regions, right? Not just the ones that you have, but the other regions as well. There's something like 329 regions in Europe. Ireland is 26% yeah. of all those regions. France is one. Mm -hmm. All of France is one. Ireland is 99 regions. Mm -hmm. So they, they, the latest Ancestry update really kind of Dialing on, on where you're from in Ireland. A buddy of mine actually, he's, he's not as into this as I am, but he, Matt McLaughlin, he uh, did the test and he is West Dingle Peninsula, East Dingle Peninsula. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> well, that makes it easy. Go for a supplement. <laughs> yeah, cocktail party science. Just keep that in mind. It, it's not fully cooked yet, it's getting better. It's not there yet. And it was probably dreamt up in the marketing. <laughs> okay, the heart of the matter, the DNA test. And again, I wanted to have an intern for browser working um, to, to show you about this, but some, most of you are already doing it. So um, we'll move on from there. Um, the best way <laughs> to think about your, your autosomal test is who's for do. Who's for do means do you remember? Right? So it's a matching game for kids. Does it match my? Does this match match my mother, or does this match match my father? That's the first questions you should be asking about any match. And from there, you can start saying, okay, so it matches my mom. Does it match her mom or her father? And then you build back from there. And the way you do that is by looking for cousins and testing cousins. And you know. Find a known cousin, you build your tree, you find a known cousin who's still alive, you convince them to pay for the test, otherwise you've got to cough up for it. And you know, then you get confirmation. You know, this part, oh, that the third test, which is triangulation, which we'll be coming to in a second, is how that works. If you go into this looking for your surname, you're gonna be sad. <laughs> Very sad. You search through a thousand fourth cousins. 970 of them will not have your name, right? So, I, I have yet to find Hannah. Mm -hmm. They're all Vivians now. Yeah. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> all right, triangulation. Who's going to do for genealogists? Um, it comes from survey, basically, and it actually stems from why DNA testing. Um, and it is a little bit different with autosomal DNA testing. But you, you know <coughs> the distance from two known points, so you can determine the distance to the third unknown point. And that's the same thing we're doing here. You need yourself, and you need a known cousin, and you need whoever the, the, the match is that you're interested in. And then you try to figure out, you build the tree, and you try to figure out how you relate it. Uh, there's two different types of triangulation in autosomal testing. Messy triangulation, which is really how Ancestry wants us to do it. 
It's based on um, ICW, which is in common with, which this this is a term that's been accepted into, you know, just, you know, I use it as slang, basically. Um, it came directly from Family Tree DNA back when they were a powerhouse. You know, in common with, it's now, Ancestry calls it your share of matches. So it's ICW, it's in common with. So it's based on that. <coughs> it's, uh, it's shunned by the purists. It's much faster and much easier, so really, what, what could possibly go wrong? <laughs> mm. uh, and then there's purist triangulation, and that's based on shared segments. That's really getting down to the nitty gritty of it, right? And you need to have the segments. And what do you not get from Ancestry? The segments. They don't release the segment data. Uh, it's much more time consuming, but it's far more accurate. Um, how you can get around the segments missing at Ancestry is the website I mentioned earlier called GenMatch. You have to make the decision, do I want to download my data from Ancestry and upload it to this third party? That's for you to make. I say do it. Um, I don't work for them. I don't get anything from them other than <coughs> DNA matches. Um, but they go through that huge file that you get from Ancestry and they parse it and they give you the segments then you're good to go, you can start doing triangulation, and that's how you do it at, uh, for Ancestry. The other way is to, to upload it to uh, Family Tree DNA. Uh, they'll give you the first, I forget the exact number, they'll give you your first like 100 matches for free, but after that you need to pay, and, you, know, you get thousands of matches. Um, here you can see I was really counting on having a web browser. Um, triangulation resources. I'll, I'll make the deck available to everybody. If you want to give me your email address, I'll delete it probably after that. But I'll, I'll send the deck out to everybody if you want to give it to me afterwards. Um, I saw this is the International Society of Genetic Genealogists. This is the thing that exists in the world today. Um, if you didn't know that, now you do. They have a wiki that is pretty detailed and updated fairly regularly. Um, so they are like the, you know, the clearinghouse of information for all of this stuff. This guy here, Blaine Bettinger, um, he is a, you know what, I don't know if these are pointer and the thing is a so I can start doing this, right? Um, he is a genetic genealogist, he's like actually a physician or anything, has anyone ever heard of him, Blaine Bettinger? Okay, he's written a couple of books on the subject and he, he's, if there's a rock star, in genetic genealogy, it's plain. Um, Don Wirtz, uh, autosomal DNA segment analyzer tool. Uh, it's available at uh, DNAGetCom. Um, this is, it's kind of dated at this point, but it's still, it has its uses. It breaks out, you know, you upload your data again to a third party, and uh, it, it parses it, and it shows you these are the people that you should really be looking at. Great soon. Out into, I forget what they call these charts, but it's like a diagonal with the, the clusters. Um, I forget what they call that chart, but it, it's very, very handy. But again, it's all based on having the segments. Uh, Kitty Cooper, who I still subscribe to Kitty Cooper's blog. She's, she's fallen off a little bit, but uh, Kitty's great. She has a lot of tools on her site as well that are, that are handy to have. Um, but she talks about triangulation and she talks about it in like a way that people can understand. Uh, the, the ISOG wiki kind of gets a little technical, blame can get a little jargony, but Kitty's like, here's how you do it, here's the result that I have doing it this way, you can do it too. Um, she's great. Uh, segmentology, this guy, his entire website is how to triangulate, and it's all based on segments. You need the segments, which I don't understand how Ancestry got to 15 million people without having segments. And then this talk right here, is one of my favorite on the topic. Morris Gleason, he's, um, he's, he was born in England, in London. He's a psychiatrist there now, I believe. But he really spends more time in Ireland than I think he does in London. And he, I think he spends more time on genealogy in general than he does on psychology. <laughs> so now he's a paycheck. Okay. Um, but this talk is really fantastic. This is from, I want to say it was late 
2018 or early 2019, this, this talk he gave about in Belfast. And it's a talk on triangulation and how he's used it in his research in Tipperary. And we may be related to him. To him? Yeah. Oh. I run into him far too often. And, yeah, like, hmm, you're here again, are you? <laughs> yeah, but definitely, crank up the volume on that, that talk. The audio was a lot like it, probably like this talk. But uh, uh, yeah, that, that's well worth it. It's 44 minutes. Um, CMs. Anyone know what a CM is? Centimeter? Charles Morgan? <laughs> it's a centimorgan. It's how you measure your cousin matches. Um, the dry version, a centimorgan, is a measure of the probability of a crossover event. A crossover event is recombination, which I think probably at some point I should probably get into. I didn't, when I read through this the first time, I was like, I didn't do recombination enough justice. Uh, the layperson's version is the amount of DNA that's shared between matches. It's not technically a measurement, like length, but it's helpful to think of it that way, especially when you're just getting started in. Like, oh, I've got a 10 centimorgan match and I've got a 230 centimorgan match. Which one are you going to focus on? 240. Of course, it's bigger. Uh, first cousins, roughly 875 centimorgan. Second cousins, 230 centimorgans. Third cousins, 74 centimorgans. And you can see that it drops off pretty quickly. And then when you start getting down into people, with like, you know, oh, you, you're a 10 centimorgan match here. We match six centimorgans. Like, just yeah. run away. <laughs> You'll never find it. Um, so it's important to remember that this is the probability of a crossover event, which is recombination. Um, this, we come back to our old friend Blaine here, set this up. This is version three, and you can see he, he kind of has has stalled out on it. This is the version that's currently posted to his website. Um, he went to the ISOC wiki, like everybody else did, and they have a chart that's very similar, and he was like, those numbers just are way off from what I'm seeing. Something's got to be done about this. They're, they're, it's not right. So he went about and opened up um, a crowd crowdfunded science program, right? Google Docs, he posted a Google Doc and said, what is the nature of the relationship? You know, it's my aunt and me, and we match this amount of data, and that's it. And he, he generally collected like thousands and thousands and thousands of results, and he built this chart out of it, and you can see, you know, here's first cousins, 874 is the average that he's found in the wild, and you know, <laughs> the range is typically here, and it's great. So this is an updated chart, though I think even the ISOC wiki is starting to say, eh, maybe our numbers are right. <laughs> Blaine may be onto something here. So this is really the chart that you should be using, because this is like based on the population, not you know, some nerd in the background <laughs> um, Let's see, let's see, let's see, let's see, let's still contribute to it. Blaine stock. Blaine stock is all about Blaine. It's everything Blaine related. We're getting t-shirts, coffee mugs. Um, this is the link to the, the page that I was explaining that chart we were just looking at, and the chart which you should bookmark. That's your homework assignment. Um, let's see, what's this page where, okay, this is where you can actually upload your, you know, you've got a weird wacky, this is my third cousin two times removed, and here's our, our amount of data. That's good, it goes in and it helps keep his numbers accurate, right? It's crowdsourcing science. Um, he's written a couple of books. Oh, this is his Facebook group, which is very popular. Uh, genetic genealogy is really kind of one of the reasons why I'm still on Facebook at this point. I'm uh, getting to be of a certain age, and I've got a kid at home, and I've got a wife at home, and I'm working 19 hours a day at work, and I don't really have time to talk about what I have for breakfast. <laughs> Um, but the genealogy groups, there's millions of them, and you know, Blaine, Blaine's group is, is really well done. He curates it well, he moderates it well, and you should check it out. If you're on Facebook, don't join it, or don't join, join Facebook just for that, but if you're already there, 
already captive. <laughs> um, shared CM. Oh man, I really wish we had working with our browser. Because this is really cool. This is another project, DNA Painter. Does anyone know that one? Anyone run into that one yet? You can upload, when you have your segment data, you can upload it, you can create it, and it maps it out. Rather than you used to have to do this in like Excel, and it was all clunky. This is a website, you said, here's, here's this match, it's this size, it's here, it starts here, it ends there, and you know, it just tracks all of it, and it's out of the cloud. It's great, I've got my mother and my father, I started Pat, and I have me, but there's no point doing it because I have mom and dad. No. Just doing that. Um, but uh, yeah, this is well worth checking out. DNAPainter.com. I think he's charging for it now. Mm -hmm. I can't imagine he's charging very much. And uh, he actually is in Blaine's group here. So they coll collaborate quite a bit. They've automated that chart that I showed you. Um, there's, there's an automation like, oh, I got a match, that's 18.4. You drop that in, it pops up Blaine's chart and shows you where the, the probabilities are of where you match. And what you do with those probabilities is you say, well, how could they be my second cousin? You build a tree, right? You have lessons. Trees, trees, people, trees. <laughs> Feed the trees. Um, let's see. Family Tree Guide to Genetic Testing. This is Blaine's first book, and this is his second book. And these links are both to where you can get them in Rhode Island libraries. Um, I'm sorry we don't have a web browser working because that's very cool. Uh, this one actually I need to return. It's overdue. You can't get this one until after the presentation. Go down the stairs and pay my fine. Um, diving deeper and more advanced techniques. And we're coming down to the end here, folks. Uh, anyone know what time it is? Um, quarter to two. Quarter to two. Okay, that's enough time. Um, IBS is identical by state, or ID, IBD, identical by descent. And there's this third one they came up with over here, which is identical by chance. And this is when you have the segments and you're looking at it and you're like, uh, where, how, how, this can't be true because this person doesn't match anywhere on my tree. Or, you know, the, the segments get so small that there's prob probabilities, that there's a lot of stats. And um, it, identical by state and identical by chance are pretty much the same thing. They're false positives. When you start getting down to, I don't like going below segments the size of 15 cent organs um, because they're just, it, it starts to be more noise than signal at that point. Um, some people are like, you can go down to seven. I think most of the testing companies have gone down to about seven. But at that point, it's 50-50. Either it's a match or it isn't. Awesome. Thanks. I'm so glad I paid you for that. Um, but below that, you know, it, it really gets dicey. I was running through my list of known cousins, and the, the, the smallest one I've got is 15.4. So it's like getting, getting below that point, it starts getting really dicey. It's hard to prove. Um, so you just need to be, these are just some, some terms you need to Chromosome mapping, that's um, you know, the beginning of the thing, you saw the, the, the colors all over here, that's the same, that's, that's really, I think, that's probably what most people should be doing, is chromosome mapping. Um, it's where you take the segments and you plot them, like they're saying, it's DNA danger. Uh, they make it really, really easy. Phasing is when you take the chromosomes, remember the two chromosomes, and you can split them if you know at least one of the parents. Right? You have, uh, and GEDmatch makes, has a tool to do this as well. Um, when you phase, you then have which parts of your DNA came from which parent, which makes matching very interesting. Um, it, it's worth looking into. These, like I said, these are more advanced techniques. You don't need to go into a visual phasing down here at the end. I had my brother tested, and my sisters tested as well. And you need three siblings, or like a close cousin, something like that, or an aunt, something like that. But three siblings is really the best to do this with, and it should be done by robots. Somebody, somebody should have written this program already. I don't think it's going to be me, because this thing is a beast. 
Um, this is a link to Blaine Bettinger's webpage on the subject, and it's page one of five, and it's like a mile long. Mm -hmm. What are you talking about? Mm -hmm. it, it, I'm sure it's effective, but yeah, I don't think it's for the average general population to get concerned with. You should be aware of it, though. It's something you can do. You got time. And you're a robot. <laughs> Uh, and we're coming back to this. Genetic genealogy is a pointer. It's, um, it's just another record type. And here's my friend GenMatch. It's a third party suite of tools developed to let testers from various testing companies compare to each other. I'm tested at Bentley Tree DNA. I want to test my, my second cousin over there who was tested at 23 and me. How can we do that? GenMatch. GenMatch solves that problem. You both upload your data, you're in the database, you can compare it to each other, you got segments, and you go from there. It's awesome. Everybody should use it. If you're serious about this hobby, do it. Um, it's not pretty. It has a steep learning curve. I don't think it's a particularly high learning curve, but it is steep. It's, because it's not pretty, it doesn't help. Um, the best tools are unlocked with a monthly fee. It's called Tier 1. It's like 10 bucks. It, it's worth it. Every now and again, I kick in 10 bucks and go nuts in advanced DNA testing. So, so. Um, uh, they're in the middle of a transition. Um, the old <coughs> database is slowly being migrated to the new database and tools. And uh, some things are a little dubious. I found a bug. It was with you, oh. actually. Um, apparently, you and I don't match in some of the <laughs> tools. And I'm like, She's my sister. We got other tests that prove it. And here's your old test. It says they're, they're brother and sister. And the new tool says they're not. And they got back to me like, in, within 36 hours, I had an answer from them. Like, thank you for bringing this to our attention. Wow. I haven't run into the answers. So they fixed it or not, but they, they were aware of it. And they were like, holy moly, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Um, it's far more stable than it used to be. Is anybody, anybody DNA tested for a long while now? Back in the day, this site used to go down like daily. Oh. You know, you get three people on there, bam, hmm. down. But it, it's very stable. Um, and, and you must do it if you're interested in this. But that brings up the whole privacy laws and law enforcement getting involved in DNA testing. Has anyone heard of that, mm -hmm. right? And again, I wish this, this link is hilarious. Um, this is an article from CNBC, a real article, about a parody website set up by an Elon Musk company, and they're parodying um, DNA testing. And how you test at this fake site is you take a picture of your saliva and upload it. <laughs> okay. 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 It's, it's hilarious. Wow. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it, it brings up a bunch of points about you know, DNA and privacy expectations and stuff like that. And this quote from the CNBC article I thought was particularly interesting about how consumer genetic companies have a challenging job building more applications to attract more customers, but you know they have to ensure that they're scientifically valid and they also have to protect privacy. And it's a hard balancing act. Um, and you know, we'll, we'll, the parody site just makes fun of that. Um, this, there's a guy and there's Carl, and he's like, uh, my DNA test revealed that I, I'm related to a serial killer in California. <laughs> I don't know how I feel about that. But my lawyer tells me I, I shouldn't worry about talking about these families. I'm not, I didn't have anything to do with those. So, it, it's a big deal. It's privacy. It's important. But I mean, like I said, there's a company now extracting DNA from envelopes that are 100 years old. So what are you going to do? If they want to find you. Um, so the big arguments are, can the cops really legally use your DNA? That's one way that they frame it. And then you also have DNA was used to find the murderer. This is a link to a 40-year-old cold case that DNA was used to find the murderer of this poor housewife in California um, fairly recently. And they put the guy in jail. You know, yeah. Murder doesn't have a statute of limitations. The crime. That's just, you know, don't kill each other. I think there's books written about that. <laughs> um, 
and, and it's all in how you frame it, you know. I'm, I'm not particularly comfortable, and this is just me personally. I'm not comfortable. If my DNA could be used to solve one of those cold cases, go do it. But you may be different. And then uh, one of the, another rock star of uh, genetic genealogy is C.C. Moore. She is one of the leaders of this, uh, this group of genetic genealogists who are using DNA to you know, say, hey, these, these matches look pretty interesting, let's build their tree. And hey, look at that, we found the back end, great. Mm -hmm. um, DNA Detectives is the name of the company she runs. But you see C.C., um, if you watch Finding the Roots, she's on there. And Gabby, this is uh, genetic genealogy for super nerds. <laughs> um, I, when I was first getting into this, it was spreadsheets, 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 build your spreadsheets, you need a million spreadsheets, and spreadsheets get very long, spreadsheets get very wide. Even at work, I was dealing with spreadsheets that are like, you know, M, M, column M, M. And mm -hmm. It's like, there's no useful information in column M. <laughs> just get rid of it, right? No spreadsheet needs to be that big. There had to be a better way of thinking about visualizing this in my head. The spreadsheets don't work for me. So um, I started looking at what data scientists use <laughs> when they're looking at this kind of data. And what I discovered was a thing called a link node graph. And it's uh, very interesting. If we can get this to work, I hope you guys are impressed by it. Um, I was downloading, I was trying to manually download all of my match data from Family Tree at the time. And it was like, the weekend went by, and I had 75 matches downloaded. And, you know, only 2,000 more to go. Great. I hadn't seen my family, you know. What are you doing up there? DNA! So, this company here, they had already cracked how to download all of the data very quickly. But they charge you five dollars a month to do that. Of course, you can you know run it every day, hundred times if you want for that five bucks. It's worth the money. But I figured I would save myself five dollars, and I wrote a program to do it myself. So, and it, doing this has significantly um, helped me focus my research. We'll get into that if we get this thing to fire up in a moment here. So, <laughs> Gaurav Mila Mahaga, and now it's time for uh, question and answer. Yes, sir. When you asked for earlier, you said you and your sister wanted to know if you had any Neanderthal DNA. Yeah. Yes. But you didn't answer the question. <laughs> she does. She does. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I don't know. I do. There's, uh, there's ways. There's, you know, everybody has their own little third-party tool that isn't maintained anymore. Um, that I, I read her numbers through, and I said, do you, I don't, do you remember? It was like three percent, yeah. something like that. Mm -hmm. So most people, they're finding more. They're always pretty calm. Then once also then there's the Viking DNA. I'm surprised you didn't have any Scandinavian DNA. Yeah, um, no. <laughs> <laughs> it was the first time I did it in Ancestry, they, they had a little blurb. If you are surprised to see Scandinavian DNA, I was just wondering if Viking I'm surprised that was one of their standard frequently asked questions is because mm -hmm. the Vikings were everywhere. Yeah, they went everywhere. And, yep. The Normans were Vikings, so there you go. Anyone else? All right. Can you talk a little bit about recombination? Because oh, people yeah. are always I mean, asking me about yeah, it. Recombination is very important. It's, it's why we're not clones, right? Why we're not clones? Clones. 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 Yes. There's no Jedi's. We're not clones. <laughs> recombination is, and I'm going to use some words here, people eggs. It's going to be one of those words that sperm is going to be um, Recombination occurs in the egg and sperm when they are forming, when you are being formed, right? This is called meiosis. It happens like it's a chemical reaction when you are formed, right? This happens. Um, it is the point of that visual phasing process that I was talking about earlier. It's getting back to where are all of these recombination points, the crossover points that they're called. In a protocell, there are, he does a better job than me, so get this book um, from the library. The protocell has 
four copies of a chromosome, right? So the mother's the mother and the mother, father. I'll try not to offend anybody putting the wrong finger. Um, <laughs> but you get four copies of each chromosome at this point in the pro proto cell, right? Then it splits, and you get four copies of each chromosome, of each chromatin, right? So then you're like this, right? Here's mom, here's dad. Um, so from there, then split out, and you got your when they when they do this, right? That's that's recombination. There's the potential for the SNPs, or actually it's the STRs, to break um, for the for the nucleotides to break and flip over. They literally flip over or move over to the next one. That's why you know she's got DNA from our parents that I don't have, and it's really awesome to see that. The first time you see it, you're like, oh, it's my sister. Oh, yeah, we match all the numbers. Hey, I don't have that one. <laughs> it's, it's pretty cool to look at. Um, and, you know, our brother, Cecil, look at that. He's got stuff that neither of us have. And it's that fruit salad that we went back to. We're all just a big bowl of fruit salad. And we match um, cousins. Like, I have cousins that I yeah. genetically match that you don't. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's where it shows up on the match list. You know, she's got a different list than I do. We're not the same person. We're, we've be combined in different ways. Uh, recombination is awesome for making individuals. It's terrible for genetic genealogists. Yeah. <laughs> it's terrible for it because just exactly that. You know, how come how come she's got this match and I don't? It's recombination. If you're ever in doubt, just go, it's recombination. Mm -hmm. right? I'm at a brick wall, recombination. Mm -hmm. right? um, it, this this was interesting. I learned it out of this book actually. Recombination can take place, right? It can take place, but it must happen to make an egg or a sperm cell when when you are being formed. And that, you know, blink of the eye, big bang moment of you is when all this takes place. Um, but it, it doesn't have to, remember, it can take place, it doesn't have to. And an entire chromosome can be handed down to a child, and that chromosome is then an exact copy of the grandparents' chromosome, wow. which is ah. mind-blowing. You can have your, your grandmother's entire chromosome, mm -hmm. which is just great stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, it didn't recombine. So, and that's on page 70 and 71 of this book. <laughs> but I highly recommend this one. This one's a little more uh, technical than his other book, um, which is the one I got for, for Pops. But he, he really, Blaine does a good job. He's a, he's a rock star for a reason. He knows his stuff, so look him up. Um, and that is recombination. Now, are there any questions? Um, so, a couple of things. Um, and I'm just, um, I have a sister. So, I just want to make, make it clear, you know, make sure I'm clear about it. So, if I, here's my 100% um, I was thinking that my sister or my brother could have. I, I thought we were both of the same 100%, but that my brother or sister could have like less than 1% of something, and I could have 90% of that same thing. Correct. That's where you're coming. You're, you got it, brother. Okay. You got but it. What about, I mean, could I, could my brother or sister have something, have 30% of something that's not even in my 100%? Absolutely. Okay. So I, yep. I didn't realize that. I yeah. Thought, I thought everyone, I mean, I thought my brothers or sisters would have the same 100%, but I knew. Yeah, the percentages could yeah. be totally different. Yeah. What about identical twins? Identical twins is an edge case that we're not going into in this presentation. <laughs> they should be similar. There are identical twins. There are. But their percentage. Yeah. Percentage yeah, yeah, should yeah. Be. They're identical for reasons. Okay. Identical. And if somebody had their DNA, how long, how long ago were these tests started? Not even. Not, not even. even. Like if somebody did this ten years ago. Should they do it again today? No. No. Not necessarily. No. no. Not unless you've been through nuclear war. <laughs> okay. Um, I had no question, but I can't remember. Okay. The Y DNA. Now that just comes from Bob. Now. Yeah. Would my brother have tests more for something from my father? How does that work? Uh, yeah, it comes down to the X chromosome at the very bottom of the, those fancy mm -hmm. uh, painter charts. There's the little tiny X chromosome down at the bottom, and that, that's where the Y DNA will be found. 
you don't have any, so you don't have to look there. You have X chromosome from both your mother and your father, right? But this gentleman here, he has Y from his mother. Right? So what would that show as far as? It, it, it would show paternity, right? And you could use it for paternity, but really it's used for deep ancestry. Like we were looking at the copper age, you know, and when we got down, it might be Y, whatever the heck it is, that was formed 1,500 years ago. My tree is good, it's not that good. <laughs> there, Ireland didn't have records then. Question. My mother was adopted. We know who her, because her biological mother died when she was two. We don't know who her father is on the founding papers, for so it's in New York, so we can get the founding papers. Yeah, but my mother was born in 33, so back at that time it was just standard. If the woman was not married, yeah. automatically yeah. it would be yeah. But on the family home, it said her father was Irish. Mm -hmm. So is there a way to find out, like, through cousins? Would they have the same? I mean, yeah, you don't know yeah, who he is, but we can find the yeah. cause of What the I line. would recommend you do is get her tested and upload it to GEDmatch, where you're going to find the most different test group from family tree DNA, and, you know, if, if you went to, you know, any of the, the, uh, the uh, ancestry angels, they call them, they're adoption, they work on adoption cases, and they would say, get your DNA tested, you know, we're sending it to get the dead match. So, we did your DNA, but we did, there's a company that only started in 2016, Living DNA. Oh, yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. She came back 21% saw your brain. <laughs> <laughs> Well, my mother was German, her father was yeah, Irish, yeah. so I agree. Yeah, but, you know, who knows? Who knows what was going on that time? Yeah. <laughs> Nobody found in... Somebody wound up in the wrong bed. <laughs> so, yeah. But for YDNA, you can use it to test maternity, but it wouldn't work for your mother because she doesn't have it. Right. So, but, um, so I have to find cousins then. You find cousins. That way, but they have to go back the same term, they have to have the same last name, right? It's the male line. Right? So hand in hand in hand in hand in hand. That, that would be yeah. the line that you're going to So you don't know. Yeah. Yeah. But you, you could potentially do it. I, you know, I don't want to claim to be an expert on doing it for certain for and, and uh, an option case. But yeah, New York is opening those records quite soon. If they are in the record already. So maybe you're yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, in my background, Scottish family, Maxwell's, and uh, they have advertised to their families that if you were you can down to the mail on a Maxwell, you send them the DNA, they'll take you all the way back to something. Oh, yeah. It, what is it a, 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 a heraldic family with the Maxwell's? I don't know if Scottish heraldry all that well, but yeah. They kept records of, you know, the nobles, of course, because they don't keep records for peasants. <laughs> um, but for, yeah, for the nobles, they would have kept re records of who married who and who married who. Um, has anybody gone into the Irish, because we're in March still, we're going to stay in Ireland, um, the, the church records that were released, I think it was last year or the year before, has anybody looked at those, the, the Catholic church records? Look them up, nli.ie. Just it's the parish registers, right? And it's the handwritten scrawl of the parish priest saying this kid was born to these parents on this day, and then there's little notes in the column over here about parents, yeah. about who, yeah, who their godparents were, who the sponsors were. Have released to any other sites or people than what the website? Is? Um, yeah, they're on. You can link to the index is linked to on Ancestry. And family search. family search has them, but I mean they, they're open. It's just open, yeah. it's public record, and and uh, uh, National Library of Ireland .ie, NLI .ie, and the parish records are phenomenal. But what you see in there, sometimes in the corner, is that you know third cousins. Yeah. You know, no. Here's here's you know, the marriage record, and it's like I forget. Sure, 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 I can't like think of the word. It's some strange word I had ask on one of the Irish groups, I was like, what? I don't even know what this word means. What is it? And it's it's cousin cousin, mm -hmm. right? They're getting married. And the reason for keeping the records. Consanguinity. Cons that's it. Yeah, cons consanguinity. 
um, is so that they knew where there were going to be problems. And I think this is why they started keeping records on the nobles. Because remember, all those European uh, royalties, they're, all those families are cousins. They're all related. Right? So, and because of that, you start getting the inbreeding problems and everything like that. I think that's why those records really started being kept originally. Because they're like, and a couple, couple generations of doing this, these guys are going to have some problems, and we're going to have to overthrow them. Find Yeah, Find My Past is another good they one. They put on the, they film, because they've gone into microfilm records for the Boston Diocese, the New York oh, Diocese, really? Baltimore Diocese, and Philadelphia Diocese. Mm. They're all online right now. Great. Not yeah. Brooklyn. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Brooklyn, they don't even answer email. <laughs> Search um, on your home computer, but if you go to the Family History Center, yeah, it's yeah. they have the fun. Yeah, family search is like it, it, I'm, I'm hanging for ancestry, so they're my start. If yeah. when I need to validate, I'll, I'll use family search yeah. for validation. Like they have a lot of stuff that ancestry just doesn't. Yeah, or ancestry has an index, and family search has an index. Yeah. What was that website you used for the actor? Uh, NLI.ie, National Library of Ireland. IE, Ireland, that's their, their top level domain name. Um, and it's the parish records, is what you're looking for. It's probably going to be a link right on the front page because it's, it's, it's awesome. See the scrawl of the parish. Some people's handwriting is so beautiful. And then there's the guys in court, and you can't read it. And you read three pages and you're blind. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, and, uh, got me thinking of, like, I have some Portuguese, so I, I, I have an older woman who helped me to read Portuguese um, for that reason. Yeah. Um, but talk about following a male line, and the Portuguese doesn't always work that way. The naming practices are yeah. so odd. Yeah. 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 Uh, they get, choose the male man if they really like it. So you can't always spell that, but I like what you said about uh, you'd think that DNA would be okay. This is it. Yeah. That's all I need to do. No. That's and just you really almost need to go to every town hall between there <laughs> too, and too and look at the records. Except there are places now like those uh, the church records, the baptismal records, which have lots of information. Yeah. Uh, it gives you great grandparents even and, and uh, stuff like that. But those are. Take, there's pictures of them now, and they're uploaded yeah. to sites where you can actually not to go scroll the yeah. film anymore. Yeah. It's a great thing. Yeah. It isn't like it was a couple of years ago. There was like you couldn't find anything. Nothing was online. No. There were no tools available to you. That's why everything was on a spreadsheet on your desktop. It was a mile long. <coughs> and these DNA like, sites, like, they not, they only go back what 500 years. The autosomal DNA will only go back reliably six generations. Good luck to you. Yeah. yeah. So. But what do you, I mean, as like the scientific side of it, like, are you interested in 25,000 years ago? I mean, if you could get back to that, like, is that like your end goal? It's, a, it, it's interesting. It's interesting to know, but, it, you know, it's not something that I like wait till I think about. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's cool, you know? It's, I've got DNA in me that is 25,000 years old, and you do too. Yeah. That's neat. It is. <laughs> it, is. it is. It is. Do I want to spend a whole lot of time? Yeah, probably not. Probably not. <laughs> Again, Brian Sykes wrote, wrote a whole bunch of books, like that Seven Daughters of Eve, which is mitochondrial. He's done, you know, the Y DNA, the autosomal, and a whole bunch of other I'm sure they're on the shelves in this library right now. Um, look them up. They're, they're an interesting read. When you showed that picture of Africa, mm -hmm. and, you know, Looked like your starting point was a combo. Yeah, that's everybody's starting point. Okay, because you know, even in as well. Yeah, it's not, even in my 500 year, that came up, and if that came up without me doing any other research besides that, I would have been like, what? What are they talking? About? <laughs> but I did find out. That Where did you test? I tested an ancestry. Okay. My mom did my heritage. Okay. 
Which my heritage, by the way, they just finished that update like a couple days ago. Yeah. They finished the main major upgrade in yeah. the software that they used yeah. for um, analyzing. Is this better? Because it's really, I wasn't all that impressed. You know what? We, we submitted, her brother, uh, her uncle submitted, and right about when we should have gotten the results, we got an email saying, it's going to be about a month more. Mm -hmm. And we wanted it for, as a birthday. Oh, so, yeah. Right. But you know what? Great. I'd rather have them upgrade their sure. software and do a better job at the yeah, 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 yeah. wait a month than worry about giving it as a birthday present. So they just finished it a couple days ago. We are probably close to the first ones to be run through the new and software. So we should be getting it soon. So I agree. I don't know whether it's better or not. Yeah. You know, but what I was thinking was um, uh, about the, the Congo and like you Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Yes. 